So first, out of the way, I'm not a pilot. So if you're disappointed, I can understand that. So anyway, so LIHOC is a great organization. I've been in the organization. We have been in the organization for almost a year. Um, but the organization has been around for 41 years. So let me first start talking a little bit about what we do, why we do it. And then uh, we, start, uh, we can get into how we work with WOLFs directly. Sounds good? Yeah. Awesome. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask your questions as we go on. Do you want me to click through? I'm fine, thanks. So, how many of you have heard about LIHOC before? Yeah, well, yeah. All right, so only a few of you. And uh, so LIHOC is one of the best kept secrets in the conservation world. And uh, one of the, my goals in the next couple of years is actually to make it more visible. As again, we have been in around for 41 years. I'm gonna, we're gonna see, you're gonna see some of the work we do. And uh, one of the things that uh, it amazes me is that we are very, not many people know us. Uh, our, what we do basically is accelerating conservation work. One of the things we recognize is that conservation is being more important now than ever. Um, and no matter what we're doing, the degradation of the environment is outpacing our conservation. So we need to accelerate that. That's why we like saying that we, we, what we do is accelerating this. We are a nonprofit. We are a conservation organization. Uh, even though what we do is flying, but we have a highly experienced conservation staff. Brooke here with us, she has 20 plus years experience in wildlife here in the US. We have Betsy, uh, one, uh, one of our program managers, another one of our program managers, more than 30 years working in the Mississippi River. We have Jonathan Meal, more than 20 years working with land trust. He was a, a, a ranger and, and so on. So we have a small group, highly qualified conservation staff, but we also leverage in a very important network of pilots. We have around 300 volunteer pilots working for LIHOC. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little more about these pilots along uh, the, uh, this talk because we are here uh, and what we do, we do it thanks to them. They volunteer their time, they volunteer their aircraft, they're, they actually donate their fuel for the conservation work. So some of these donations can, at the end of the year, can some tens of thousands of dollars. And they do this because they believe in conservation. Um, and as I said, what we do is accelerate conservation. Uh, and we give the conservation world a new way of seeing us, the, uh, of seeing the environment. We give it this bird eye view that most of us, I mean, we all have probably been on an airplane at 30,000 uh, feet. But not many of us have been in a small airplane at 200 feet above, above the water, the ground. Things look different. When you go on the road, you see just this wall of trees. Get up the air, and then you see the problems completely different. And you see also the solutions. So that's what we do. Um, how we do it? And we do it in many different ways. But we kind of like saying these three different, this, this three different ways. First. We promote decision making by acquiring data. So we work with researchers, we work with uh, other nonprofits, with, with other organizations to gather data that we can do only from the air. Um, we improve the efficiency of conservation work. One, examples that we, one of the examples we like uh, having here is with land trust. Sometimes, and you know that these land trusts, they have requirement to monitor the land every so often. And some of these land trusts are really huge. So it takes a lot of time, a lot of power, a lot of people, many, many weeks trying to monitor these areas. When we get in the airplane, they can do it in a couple hours. So we are improving that process. But also we foster dialogue. And what we do here, things for one of the ways our pilots like working more with us is by acquiring photography and videography, working with journalists. So we have extensively worked 
with the National Geographic, with uh, different uh, videographers and uh, from uh, on photographers from the New York Times, the the Washington Post, the Miami Herald, the Denver Post, acquiring these images that they use in their articles to highlight environmental problems. So that's very, very powerful what we do in these areas. Um, let me for a minute talk a, a, little, a little bit about the history of Lighthawk. And uh, as I said, we've been around for 42 years, something like that. We were founded in 1979. And our founder is um, or was a pilot, a very well known pilot in the aviation world, uh, but sitting. And basically he was in the military and after he retired from the military, he has his own plane and he used to fly his family and himself around the country. And he starts seeing all these problems that he was only seeing from the air. So he got inspired by that. He started talking to people, flying people out. And little by little, we, we, we grow. We grew. We grew to what we have now that is an international organization. We work not only in the US, but we also currently work in Mexico and Canada. Most, 90% of our flights are certainly in the US. We work a little more in Mexico, Canada, just few. But in the past, we have worked also over Central America, all the way to Panama. And in, it's in our plans in the next couple of years to go back there because we know that, especially in countries where uh, resources are scarce for conservation, having a, something like this can really, really improve the pace of conservation in these countries. By the way, I'm Colombian, so just having that out of the way. Um, something else about our pilots. We rely on very experienced pilots. Not every pilot qualifies as a Lighthawk pilot. There, and you probably know there are many organizations that uh, gives uh, or pilots can donate their time for these organizations. Most of them are in the medical field to transport patients from very isolated areas to hospitals, things like that. In our case, we require our pilots to have at least a thousand hours of, as pilot in command. This is the highest in the industry. These other organizations, they usually require 500, 750 hours. And the reason we require 1,000 hours is because we need a better assessment of the risks that we have when flying. We, our flights are not regular flights. Most of our flights, especially some of the ones that Brooke does, uh, uh, doing uh, surveys or with photographers, we fly very low, we fly slow. And where you're a pilot, the worst thing you want to do is fly low and slow. <laughs> if you fly too slow, you're going to go down. If something happens where you're going low, you're going down. So um, that's why we require this. And this is not saying that we do risky flights. It's just having a better risk assessment. For us, a risk assessment and adequate management of risk is very important. Um, just in perspective, a thousand hours flight uh, flying as a pilot in command is usually probably 10 years being a pilot. So it's very, they are very experienced pilots. And most of our pilots are former military, former Ireland pilots, and, peop and like other people that have flown for 40 years. <coughs> Bless you. Um, so as I said, our staff, we are not pilots. We are conservationists. Brooke is a wildlife biologist, 20 plus year experience. I myself am a marine biologist. 25 years working in conservation in different areas. Um, but we rely on this network of pilots all over the US. And I said, usually we have three, about 300 volunteer pilots. We, let's say that we have about, about 150 of them highly committed to the organization. That's a very important asset because they are all over the country. One of the areas that we actually have less pilots is in this area and one of the, of the uh, challenges for the next couple of years is to start recruiting new pilots in this area. Um, what we do, it can be interpreted in different ways. You have a conservation partner, a conservation organization like yourself saying, we, need, we have this need and we try to help you fulfilling that need. But what we really want to do or we what really like doing is we together identify the need and identify the way of doing, having that partnership. And I always said when I was 
a field biologist when I was a researcher in marine biology. I went to my desk and, you know, I kind of point down a nice survey and then I went and rent a boat to get that survey and then at the end of the day I was able to get 50% of that. So what we're doing is working with you to try to do 100%, to, to do a better survey, to, do a, a, to really fulfill what you need from this flight um, in all different ways. As probably most conservation organizations, we have these areas of work. We have these focus areas. I think most of us are doing the same. We do climate change. We do wildlife, wild places, and landscape ecology, basically, watersheds, ocean, and coasts. Um, but the way we do it is a little different. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. And I forgot to say that I have some little flyers here with some of that, my card. So uh, we can just put it on the back and they, or, or just, yeah. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about some of the things we do, thanks Brooke, in these different areas. For example, uh, climate change. We recognize, and one of the things we do is that we recognize that we are contributors to climate change. General aviation, it's hard for climate. We fly very few people in a plane, but we also recognize that this is the only way of doing many of the things we do. So we're trying to produce a positive change to the environment in this case. So one of the examples of that is measuring air pollution. And we are trying to concentrate this particularly in methane detection. So we are trying to launch a program in this. Um, just, we're just waiting. Uh, right now we have a, a special mission with a small organization that's called Ingleside by the Sea that is a small nonprofit in uh, near Corpus Christi, Texas. Texas A&M University at Corpus Christi and uh, another organization that is Fact Tracker. And what we're doing is going to put uh, sensors in one of our planes, basically a spectrometer, and, and we're going to sniff for methane over Corpus Christi. We've been trying to do this mission for six months now. The first time uh, we had problems with weather and then with the schedule of the researchers and so on. But the idea, and we have done this in the past, is to equip the, to put the equipment on board, get up little tube to the wing, and in that way, uh, we fly it over Corpus Christi looking for methane uh, emissions. And we can do things like that. Of course, we document extreme events. And this is very important because I think we all are aware of the consequences of climate change. But it's important to keep showing what's happening um, to get more support. Um, but also, one of the areas we have worked in the past, especially with Fact Tracker, is to evidence those problems of some extractive industries and some extractive activities like fracking or mining. Uh, so, well, we know that thanks to fracking, we all have gas now, but the consequences in some areas are very, very important. So we try to highlight those problems. Um, this, by the way, is the flooding in January, February in California. This is Napa Valley. Uh, Wild places. And wild places, as I said, is land landscape ecology. And one of the things we do more in landscape ecology on wild places is working with um, land trusts. And I already mentioned some of the things we do with them. We work very extensively with them in the Northeast, a little bit in Colorado, in some other places. But we also work, for example, with Washington National Parks, with their foundation. And one of the things we do is we help them get support for their cause. So with them, they call us and we help them flying supporters, people that want to donate a little money to the cause. So flying them both with Washington National Park, also with some land trust, inspire these potential donors to donate to the cause. And actually seeing, hey, there is where your money is going to be worth. That makes a difference. So we inspire them by doing that. Of course, we work a lot with journalists, with journalists to take photos, videos, to help them create these important pieces of education. 
wildlife. And I'm not going to talk too much about wildlife. So I'm going to leave that to Brooke. But we transport a number of different species, and that's one of the things we do. Um, just an example of one I like. And in 2019, uh, we transported some salmon to some mamish. Brooke, you live there. You know the name. Sorry. No, but well, thanks, Kokani salmon to the hatchery. So as we all know, the problems of uh, that salmons are having in the West Coast. Basically, they're having problems. Numbers are going down. So we flew these, these salmon to the hatchery. They were able to grow the salmon. And in 2022, last year, we flew back some eggs to the original place. So basically, we are closing the circle. We are trying to bring new, uh, to release new individuals in, into the environment. That's important. Another one we do a lot and we like doing a lot is working with uh, wildlife assessment. And one example of that is what we have here. So we have one of our airplanes and we have an antenna. So basically this is looking for condors. So we, know, we all know that condors are going down. We have about 400 individuals. Uh, most of them have BHF tags and they're con uh, continuously monitoring. Uh, sometimes they wander outside their, their site, and who they call? They call Brooke. Hey, my Condor 238 has been lost for a week. What can we do? So Brooke calls some of our pilots that have the equipment, and we put a flight in the air looking for them. Uh, I think it was beginning of last year, we were able to find one of these condors. We gave the coordinates to their land crew. They went there, they recovered the condor, and they happened the condor had lead poisoning transferred them to the hospital, went to surgery, and she recovered. And we put back, uh, her back in the, in the wild. So when you have, and you know this better than me, when you have 400 individuals, every single of these animals is precious, is invaluable. So we help them with this. Uh, watersheds. This is a very important resource. And we're seeing uh, for the last couple of years, we have work extensively in the Colorado River. So a lot of what we do is documenting what's happening, working with uh, journalists to highlight this. Uh, there's a special issue from the Denver Post that is coming soon. They're gonna design a whole website looking about the entire Colorado River. Um, so that's very important. Doing something similar with the Delaware. And here's a piece of news. We are launching a Mississippi initiative. We are still working on that. We are trying to understand what the needs are, trying to find the partners. So if you think you can benefit from this, please talk to me, please talk to us, and we can have this conversation. We are just in the process of planning, of understanding what we need, and it's gonna take a while, but that's one of the goals for the next year. Finally, oceans and coasts. And I'm, I'm not gonna stop here that much. I'm go just gonna show this and this particular mission. And this is, I like this mission a lot first because it was the first mission I monitored for Lighthawk a year ago. It's marine, I'm a marine biologist. And this is the San Juan Islands in Washington. So we're working with the Whale Museum. And what they're doing is they're developing a, what is called a pub Ha a, a, a harbor seal pop index. So basically what they do is fly, they fly all over San Juan Islands, they count uh, harbor seal and they count the pops. And depending of course, if it's a good year, if it's a healthy environment, a lot of pops will be produced. If they see something uh, irregular, well, less pops. But what really struck me about this particular mission is the route. In green, you can see the flight path. There's no other way, there's no other organization that can do this. This is flying 200 feet above sea level, very slow, 70 knots, I believe, 80 knots, and having all these patterns, patterns. And just, oh, there's the pub, let's go around and take another picture. <laughs> let's go around and take picture. And we do that, and our pilots love doing that. They do love going like, oh, do you want to circle around for a better take for your picture of your video? Let's go around. 
So le they love doing them. There's no one else that does this, and that's very unique about Lighthawk. Um, so I'm just going to stop here for now. I'm not going to leave you with Lighthawk. Uh, this wolf was, we helped rec uh, rescue, rescue this wolf, I think, in 2015, 2016. It's in New York, and it's called Lighthawk, thanks to, to the work we're doing. So I'm going to leave you with Brooke next. So as uh, Diego mentioned, um, I'm uh, Brooke George. Uh, my previous experience before coming to Lighthawk was as a, um, a wildlife biologist with uh, state agencies and universities in, um, from everywhere in the country, from the southeast area to uh, Pacific Northwest um, and Central America as well. Um, most of my work is in endangered species management um, and wildlife disease. Uh, I've done a lot of aerial surveys myself before coming to Lighthawk, mostly in the Pacific Northwest for elk, mountain goats, uh, golden eagles, uh, and several different deer species. Um, and that was for population management. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is basically uh, a focus on wildlife transport, um, but we also at Lighthawk, we use our expertise to uh, build out with our partners wildlife surveys as well if they need them. Um, so uh, one of the things that, that gives us an advantage is that, that not only do we have the pilots who can fly this and we spend the time trying to find the appropriate pilot and aircraft, that are suitable to get the best and most accurate information. Um, we also um, build out the surveys as well, so we understand how much time the pilot can spend in the air. And these are all things that contractors do for agencies generally at, the, at a cost of about $1,200 an hour. So we um, provide those services almost the same for no cost to our partners. So it allows one, just to give you an example, one of the surveys that we're working on right now is trying to understand um, Wolverine usage in Mount Rainier. So um, we have a pilot with an appropriate aircraft and we are building out that survey with um, our very small nonprofit conservation uh, uh, Cascade Carnivores um, is the organization, and they are very small, and they don't have a lot of funding, and so they have limited information on how wolverines are using the area, and so bringing in aviation, building out that survey allows them to understand the species better, how they're denning, uh, what time of year they're denning, when are they moving, when are they dispersing. All of that information can be found out where it hasn't been previously because it's been cost prohibitive. So that's, um, without going too much into surveys, that kind of gives you an idea of what, what we do in that, in that realm. Um, so as far as transport, it's a very similar situation. We work directly with our partners to um, find an aircraft and pilot that are suitable for the partner and the wildlife that we're transporting. Well, right now we're working with the, um, the AZ AZA um, with species that have uh, survival plans, recovery plans in, in place. We're trying to expand out our services in that sector. Um, and we basically provide um, wildlife with a customized, safe, and uh, rapid transport to where they need to go, either for part of a breeding program or for release. Um, and these are all private aircraft. Um, and one of the things I was mentioning before I said <laughs> before the lights um, was that we have, we have things that we, we need to understand, like, um, crate sizes, number of animals, and how we're going to get these animals through the door of an aircraft that also needs to be uh, fast to get across the country. Uh, so we work that all out with our partners and the pilots beforehand. So it's all a conversation to make these things happen rather than just here's your ticket, 
see you on the tarmac, maybe, <laughs> kind of situation. Um, so because we have a small pilot fleet, we do have to limit the wildlife that are eligible for transport with us. So um, wildlife that have uh, species survival plans, recovery plans in place, um, and basically we, we, so far we can cover any of uh, the wildlife that have um, recovery plans and, and we don't have to gauge the greatest conservation need. So basically we currently with our pilot capacity don't have to say that a black footed ferret has a greater conservation need than a red wolf or a Mexican wolf. We can try to accommodate both species programs um, going forward. So we're lucky to be, <laughs> to be able to do that. Um, but uh, basically it's where aviation is gonna help the programs be the most successful in recovering species. Uh, so we <coughs> consider flight requests that support genetic diversity, <coughs> captive breeding success, reintroduction, um, and manage wild population of endangered species. Um, so one of the limitations we've had to put on is um, we typically do not fly for display animals or education animals. So unless they are part of a recovery program, we typically have to limit um, those animals, unfortunately. And then as I was saying, crate size and weight restrictions um, vary by aircraft and that's something that we work out together to find out the appropriate aircraft. Um, so just to go through some of the differences between commercial flight risks and what we offer as we kind of mentioned a little bit. Um, so a lot of commercial airlines are just not flying wildlife anymore. Um, there are situations where, you know, once, once you bring an animal, and as Diego said, and you all know, each one of these animals is just extremely valuable in the recovery of the species. So once you have created your animal and you've brought it to the airport, you, you, um, hand it over and you have no control. And um, from there, there are comfort and safety concerns and, it, and the, the crate and the animal are at the whim of the airport staff. So we allow our partners to have access to our, uh, the tarmacs and the ramps. So we generally set it up so that um, a, a, an individual with a cargo van can drive through a gate and directly to the plane and you can load your animal on the plane and then yourself as well if, if you are going. Um, commercial airlines are, are typically much longer than, than our uh, flights, uh, both for the additional ground transportation that you need and also the waiting and the layover and everything else. Um, one of the things that we can do obviously that commercial airlines can't, is we can go to you, to, so the nearest airport to you, um, to, to load your animals, and then we can fly to the closest airport to where the animal is going. So we really limit um, travel time for the partners and in turn um, reduces the, the time in crates for the animals, which reduces stress and allows them to be more successful in whatever new role they're, they're playing. Um, so, and then there's the cost, which is always an issue. Um, and um, as Diego mentioned, our pilots, um, especially the ones that have these larger, more expensive aircrafts and are going longer distances, it's, it's very, very costly for them, but it's at no cost to our partners. Um, okay, let's see if we have a Diego, I think your computer's broken. Um, okay, so... <laughs> um, okay, so as Diego mentioned, we have a nationwide network of pilots. Uh, 
300, probably 150, 200 active. Our transport fleet is quite a bit uh, smaller than that. Um, I would say probably we have about 70 pilots who are capable of flying transport. And then if it, they're smaller crates, then we can open it up to our, our fuller fleet. So if, if it's a shorter distance, smaller crates, then we have access to all 150. If it's a wolf, we have about 70 across the country that we can access. Fewer of them are actually active and <laughs> responsive, but sometimes we go directly to them and, and uh, have a discussion. And, and we can generally bring them on board. So we do all of that work for our partners to set up the flights. Um, and Diego mentioned most of these. Um, the C-150s, so it's a very small plane, um, really, really good for uh, surveys, great for surveys, typical for surveys, um, but uh, not necessarily great to fly from one state to another because they don't fly very fast. Uh, so those are our survey planes. <laughs> PC-24s can cross the country back and forth in a day. So um, we essentially have a varied, uh, we like to say we have a small little air force, our own little air force. <laughs> um, so just to go through some of the other species programs before we get into wolves with light hawk. Um, we, as Diego mentioned, we do a lot of wildlife transport, um, a lot of endangered, different endangered species that require different things for, for transport. So those are the, the kokanee uh, salmon eggs that Diego mentions. Um, this up here is white abalone in, in uh, California. Um, there is a recovery program for NOAA it's a, it's a collaboration between NOAA and Bodega Marine Lab, plus uh, I believe four other uh, breeding facilities in California. So we actually will transport abalone at different stages in development between all of those facilities. And then um, a certain stock of abalone are then released to the wild and they actually plant them on the, the rocky outcroppings. Sometimes at certain stages, we're flying um, two and a half, three million abalone. So um, <laughs> right now, and I don't like this because I wish it were different, but um, we have a saying where there are more abalone in the air than there are in the sea. So, um, that program has expanded over the year, and we are, pro we are providing um, the majority of transportation for that collaborative program. Um, Blackfooted ferret is recovering. Um, we transport between the Toronto Zoo and um, the, the Blackfooted Ferret, Con Black ferret Conservation Center in uh, around Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, so we will transport their breeding and release animals. And then lately, um, we've been transporting the, the surrogates that are carrying um, the clone embryos because they have added a cloning program into the black blue ferret. So, um, California condors, we transport eggs, um, chicks, adults, um, this year we did a switcheroo between the Oregon Zoo and the LA Zoo. Um, they had the, the LA Zoo had a year and a half year old bird who was going to learn how to be a successful breeding bird in Oregon. And Oregon had an older condor who needed to go to LA to be a mentor um, <laughs> for younger birds. Um, and so, we actually had two pilots. Um, one flew one condor down from Portland and one flew another condor from Los Angeles. They met in Central California. They exchanged birds and handlers and then they both went back with different birds and handlers to the, um, the zoos with the new animals. Uh, so um, we have a lot of flexibility 
so we also have the condor from Portland was actually supposed to fly with about 14 fruit bats that needed to go to San Diego. So, <laughs> um, so we can build in flexibility for these species. Um, the river otter, it seems to, we haven't flown um, for river otter program very well recently. Uh, whooping cranes, we fly um, eggs and adults and juveniles. Can you see? Okay. Am I in the way? <laughs> um, and then the orange-breasted falcon, the aplomato falcon. These are transports we did down into Central America. Um, and we've done some red panda. And that's... And, from time to time, an occasional, an occasional need will pop up where we're not fully invested in the program, but we will move an animal for someone in a, that is needed, and especially on emergency situations. Um, the contour, condor, just to elaborate um, a little bit more about the telemetry program, they um, ha are having their condors disperse further. So, so we have two different telemetry teams of pilots who are rapid response. So if Pentacles National Park or Santa Barbara Zoo call us and they can't find their condors um, and it's too far to drive, we get a plane to them within a couple of days. And we have two pilots who rotate a regular monthly flight. So we build that out for them. Um, so each, each team, consists of two pilots, or, or no, the um, Pinnacles has three pilots, and um, we just, they just, they just do telemetry monitoring every month, and they schedule with the partners. So, um, and like I said, we, we built that out for them as their needs changed within the recovery program. Okay, so this is going to kind of roll through some of our, the, pictures of everyone. I'm sure some people will recognize some people over the years uh, transporting red and uh, Mexican wolves. Um, so just to go through this past year, 2022 through 2023, so fall, winter, and then the spring cross foster season, um, we transported 28 wolves across the country. Uh, let's see, we had the red wolves who were released in North Carolina, four wolves. Um, so that's this yellow pie there. Um, in the fall and winter, we, we transported, uh, I don't have the exact number for red wolves for the breeding program, I believe it was six, five or six, those. Um, we did an international transfer for two adult Mexican wolves and then one um, sort of uh, capacity relieving mission um, and then half of our work was for pups and we transported 14 pups but 13 went out to the wild so um, and that was this year alone it ended up being about 91 flight hours for pilots and um, in total I would say over 10,000 10,000 miles more than that um, so we began transporting wolves in 2009. There were only two. One of them was a medical reason. Um, and it's expanded over the years. And then once cross-fostering started to become successful, and we seem to be the easiest and most effective way to work that program, um, we um, have just continuously expanded year over year with helping the red wolves and Mexican wolves. I'm speeding it along, I promise. <laughs> um, so in total, since 2009, we have uh, about 500 flight hours. So that's actual time in a plane for our pilots. Um, and uh, in total, um, 130, 130 wolves that we've moved across the country. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And we will be expanding, um, or we're working towards increasing our, our pilot capacity who can do these transports. So if there is a need, we can meet all of them, even the shorter regional flights for wolves in, 
you know, transporting between facilities. So. So to make it common on that, and then you will send without increase your budget by six percent to do what they did for nothing. <laughs> We have to, I mean, that is one thing that really makes us different is our, our pilots are not just transporting an, a, a crate. They are vested in the recovery of the species. So they're there year over year over year to help with these animals. Um, and that is, you don't get that from chartering a flight and you don't get it from FedEx or UPS or American, <laughs> so um, nothing against them. We there, but <laughs> it is a little edge that not only do we work with you to to make sure the animal is safe and comfortable, and you can check on how they are doing. You can do welfare checks throughout the flight. We make sure that's available, or feeding mid-flight for the pups. Um, we also. Um, um, we also have our pilots dedicated as well. So it's really a nice package for these programs and these species. So let's see, there's a one more slide. Here we go. Or, we're gonna switch switch out. Okay. Oh. Oh, jeez. Do you want me to just go through this slide? <laughs> All right, let me just do it. <laughs> Okay, so for the future, and Diego, just shout out if you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the, uh, for the future, we would like to be the number one uh, choice for transport of endangered species. Um, that's what we would like to do. We're not there yet. Um, we still have some growth to do with our pilots and engagement, um, but that is our that is our goal, um, and that is to have a, for us to have a measurable impact of recovery. Um, let's see. Uh, one of our goals is to um, further establish our partnerships so that we are included in recovery plan reviews, um, scheduling um, updates, that we're not a sort of a side thought on how to get from A to B, that we're actually involved and able to, um, to offer assistance when we have all the information so we can be the most help within these recovery programs. Um, and so that goes to working ahead of time so, or working with partners so we can plan accordingly um, and, and make sure that we have the capacity to meet meet pilot needs or i'm sorry meet partner needs pilot capacity partner needs um, and we are seeing an increase in demand um, and so we we need to be prepared so uh, we need to make sure our pilots have the right equipment that we have the support and that we have a, a funding source and donor network who can help us along the way in this process. And did, is it, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, well, only that uh, in the last point that uh, it's very important. What we're seeing, and you know this, because of the airliners now not transporting some of these wildlife, more restrictions, and the constant increase of the recovery plan, we're gonna see we're seeing more demand, and we expect this demand to actually grow more and more in the coming years. That's why it's important for us. We have, and as Brooke said, we have a subgroup of our pilots, especially with the large airplanes, that are capable of, of going coast to coast and doing a lot of this transport. But every time it's a little more difficult because we have more demand. Some of these flights are basically $1,200, $1,500 per hour. Uh, and if you go to coast to coast and then come back, sometimes it's a big ask for our pilots. Hmm. And of course, they're also busy people, they take their time to do these things, so we need to increase our network of pilots. We're going to work on that, or we're working on that right now. Um, but at the same time, it's not only the pilots, and that part is free of charge. 
for our partners. But we also have to increase our donors. We have to increase work with you guys, work with our conservation partners to see how we can get those grants, how we can get that support that we need to increase our staff. Our staff is also, Brooke is a good example, overworked. Uh, and we, we need to increase that. So it has to be uh, a partnership because if we succeed, you guys succeed. So that's coming for the, for the future as well.